I think that if we're if we spend all of our time considering gods and angels and demons and heaven and hell and salvation and sin and all those things, nirvana, whatever, yeah, then we're not actually reflecting on what makes us human. We're trying to run away from what makes us human. Yeah, and for me, secular humanism, which this book never actually uses the phrase secular humanism, but that this book is essentially a a secular humanist book right. um, is, is it's embracing what makes us human, um, which is our sense of finitude. The fact that we don't live forever. The fact that uh, the, we don't get time back, yeah. you know, because uh, you can always have new friends and you can always have new and you can always have more money, but you can never get back your time. Yeah. Hi, and welcome to Red Reviews, the show where we uh, cover a variety of books from a Marxist and anarchist perspective. And I'm joined by my friend, Justin Clark. Thanks for joining me. Happy New Year, my dear friend. How are you? Happy New Year. I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Thanks. Uh, New Year. I feel like this, uh, it's been a really great year for the show. Um, We're going into, what is this now? Year three of the show? Yeah. Three or four? Yeah. Yeah. So we're, you know, it's pretty exciting to, to, um, to be able to continue doing the show with you. And it's definitely, like I say, I've said before, it's the longest project I've ever worked on like this and I, and I love doing it. So, um, I'm glad to be here tonight and I'm glad that we can stream from multiple places, uh, sure. and then people can then watch the, the super fancy edited version later. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in six, six months. In six months, right? <laughs> so happy new year recorded in, you know, as you see it in June. <laughs> that's right. Um, that's all right. That's all right. You know, good things come to those who wait. Yeah. Um, and so um, so tonight, this book was originally meant to be the last book of 2023. It's kind of ending the year on a bang, but we're gonna start 2024, I think, with a bang, in the sense that I love the book we're gonna talk about tonight. It covers so much ground in such a short amount of time and short, short, short amount of pages, small cool. amount of pages. And um, I think it has everything in it that sort of animates me as a thinker when it comes to ideas that I get passionate about, you know, secular humanism, Marxism, socialism, uh, humanity, all of that. Those are the Very things cool. that really, really get me, get me excited about a book. And this book has all of those. So tonight, We're going to be talking about um, the book called uh, This Life, Secular Faith and Spiritual Freedom by Martin Hagland. Ah. Um, Hagland is um, a professor at Yale University, um, and he's originally from Sweden. um, And his book, uh, he's he's written a variety of different books, and he, he writes a lot about sort of the nature of time. Um, and, and how time relates to us as human beings. And that's a big part of this book too. Um, but he's written about philosophers as varied as like Hegel and Derrida. And, and so it, he's really, he's really an interesting guy, but what he's doing is reconceptualizing what we think of when we think about faith, you know, when okay. we think about faith, oftentimes we think about religion, right? Yeah. And what he's arguing for is that religious faith, which is sort of the faith in the infinite is not good at all. It doesn't work. And the only true way to have any real faith in our lives is to have secular faith. Okay. And, and um, secular faith is essentially a commitment to finitude. So what does he mean by that? Basically life is finite Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Maybe someday we'll be uploaded into a computer. Maybe someday we will we will will defeat death. I doubt it. I think death is a part of the human condition, and and death is a part of life. And embracing yeah. the fact that death is a part of life, and the fact that we're only really guaranteed one life to live, yeah, is a sense of being human, and that's the sense of having secular faith. That you have faith in others, you have faith in yourself. And you have faith and commitments to others beyond just your own sort of basic needs, 
Um, and that's where here, you know, the back, the first half of the book is a little bit more sort of uh, self-referential and philosophical. And the back part of the book, while also philosophical, is also is very overtly political okay. and socialist in its orientation. Oh, very good. Um, and so, uh, so that's really kind of the setup. Is in okay. secular faith. So, so he writes about how religious figures in the past, you know, people like uh, St. Augustine, for example, often write with great reverence for notions of finite time. Um, in the Confessions, which is probably one of the most famous works of Western philosophy and theology, St. Augustine writes a lot about how time shapes us all and how the nature of how we experience time, you know, because okay. we're constantly going forward. You know, and, and I think I'm going to be paraphrasing Kierkegaard here, who's a, another philosopher that sort of is a part of this book. But it's the idea of sort of we only experience life forward, but we can only understand it backward, mm. which is true. I think that like, you know, oftentimes as we're going through life, we don't quite understand it until we reflect upon it. Yeah. And so secular faith, or a sense of, you know, what we'd call, you know, secular humanism is sort of a understanding of the past, a reverence for the present, and hope for the future, and how those three things go together. Um, and hope is very different than optimism. Yeah. Um, this is something we've talked about before. You know, Terry Eagleton has this great idea of, you know, fit, you know op optimism without hope, or hope without optimism. Right. Um, and, and I like that quite a bit. Um, so, you know, we have to recognize that we're not just, a, we are dependent upon our finitude. So we live in fragile bodies that are a part of the material universe that eventually break down and die. Yeah. That's what we are part of. And acknowledging that makes life precious. You know, for yep. most religions, life is pretty cheap. You know? Right. It's the, it's the ticket. The, it's the, the thing you do before you go to heaven or whatever. Mm -hmm. So life's fairly cheap, which means that nothing really matters. And, and he makes this point beautifully where he, he writes about how if we can understand everything or experience everything, which is kind of what it is, I guess, to be one with God or to have a sense of God or whatever, okay. then really, really we're experiencing nothing that like, if you can, can conceive of everything, then you can't really conceive of anything at all because the the idea of infinitude doesn't really exist in the way that we ex understand life. Right. You know, like we, there's there's a certain time limit on almost everything, right? So, like, you know, the human body breaks down, and you know, hopefully, you get to be 80, 75, 80 years old, maybe even older, and you pass away. You know, and and uh, and I feel like saying, oh, well, they're in a better place, or oh, they got to go to heaven, like, or whatever. I feel like that really kind of cheapens the life that they lived, it kind of, it takes away their uniqueness as a person. Right. That this, this unique individual existed in this very small amount of time within the vast chasms of time that exist in the universe. This one person is here for this moment. So I was reading this book, you know, um, started reading this book about a year out from the, the passing of my grandmother. Okay. Who was 86 when she passed. She was basically healthy until she was in her early 80s. Um, and I was sort of working through the grief of that. And this book was a great source of comfort to me because it helped me understand why that grief meant something to me, which is that right. my grandmother, like, I don't believe she's in heaven because I don't think heaven exists, right? I think right. when she died, she's gone forever. I don't think, you know, my grandma's never coming back. Yeah, And I think that acknowledging the fact that her life was finite that she was here for this brief moment in the history of the world and in the history of the universe yeah and did so many good things for me and did so many good things for others and and was kind and charitable and thoughtful those are things that make her life worth something you know yeah and and so the only sense of of immortality that I think we ever really get to have is how people remember us, you know, but there will come a time, you know, maybe even a hundred years from now where I'm dead and uh, no one knows who I am and that's okay. 
because it doesn't matter. What matters is how you're experiencing life today and how your sense of the ho- having a hope for a future, you know, um, because Haglin is very much also, he's kind of a, he's not really big on Buddhism and he's not really big on Stoicism either. He sees both of those as, of those philosophies as having the same problem that like religion has broadly, which is sort of a rejection of this life in favor of something else. So for like Stoicism, it's about sort of rejecting all of the feelings about your life and just sort of yeah sort of facing it with a sense of um what he what is called ataraxia or essentially apathy where you you have a sort of a a detachment from everything because if you're not attached to anything then you won't have to feel anything about it and if you feel if you don't have to feel anything about it then you don't have to work through any of what that makes you feel like yeah and buddhism is kind of the same thing in the sense of nirvana right like it's about rejecting the the potential of it's rejecting the potential of the future and the importance of the past. Mm. So he, he's very much against this idea of, you know, think about the present, live in the present. And, and his whole point is like, that's all total bullshit. None of us live in the present at any given moment. We're constantly either reflecting upon the past or considering what would be our future. Yeah. And we live in that continuum all the time, yeah. you know? And, and, um, and so recognizing that, is a part of our finitude because whatever it is, whether it's Christianity or it's Islam or Stoicism or Buddhism or whatever, all of these are about rejecting the sense of the finitude, rejecting the sense of the um, what is sort of unique and special to you in service of like this broader goal and this sort of broader idea that you can live that is detached from your own life. Right. Um, And yeah, stoicism is like really popular right now. And I just want to make a quick tangent. Before I do that, we might have some viewers and they may have said some things. And I want to acknowledge them. Uh, yeah. So we've got Kerrigan is here. Um, Hi, Kerrigan. Thank you so and, much for being here. And Demand Better World is here. Oh, thank you so much. And they had a question. Uh, uh, what would be the topic subtitle? Uh, at the, be at the moment. I missed the person slash idea we were discussing. Sure. So the book is called This Life, um, Secular Faith and Spiritual Freedom, and it's by uh, a philosopher named Martin Hagelin. Um, so we've been considering the concept of secular faith. Um, and you probably hear the word faith, you think of this as being religious, but in many respects, what Martin Hagelin's doing in this book is sort of reclaiming faith and the notion of faith for a secular world and for a mm. secular audience. Um, because, um, he essentially arrives to the conclusion that I've, I've sort of arrived at, which is that religion sort of limits the capacity for us to ex- understand the human experience. I think that if we're, if we spend all of our time considering gods and angels and demons and heaven and hell and salvation and sin and all those things, nirvana, whatever. Yeah then we're not actually reflecting on what makes us human. We're trying to run away from what makes us human. Yeah. And for me, secular humanism, which this book never actually uses the phrase secular humanism, but that this book is essentially a, a secular humanist book, right. um, is, is it's embracing what makes us human, um, which is our sense of finitude. The fact that we don't live forever. The fact that, uh, we don't get time back, yeah. you know, because uh, you can always have new friends and you can always have new and you can always have more money, but you can never get back your time. Yeah. And time is the one thing you never really get back. And it's a sense of that secular faith is, you know, it's it's basically having objects of devotion, but those objects of devotion are not like external to us. They're not like gods or or saints or whatever. It's external devotion to um, yourself, um, a devotion to others and a devotion to a better world or what, um, what he later on calls in the book, like a spiritual cause or secular cause in the case of, of socialism, it would be, you know, socialism is that, right. You know, my socialism is a reflection of my humanism. Um, it's, it's, you know, I don't really care all that much about heaven because it's a maybe. What yeah. I do care about is the possibility of bringing heaven to earth, which is what socialism is. 
Yeah. It's about, it's about trying to make the world a better place so that we can be free from exploitation, that we can be free from, from war and that we can be free from, uh, uh, human misery. Yeah. Now we'll not be completely free of those things. I don't think we can try. Yeah. We can deal with them better is the thing. But we can deal with them much better, right? Like yeah. this is the notion I've talked about before of the idea that like, you know, for Marx and Engels, like socialism is when human history really begins. That everything we've lived in so far is essentially prehistorical. That like, or in, in, in some respects, pre-political. That real history and real politics is socialism it's, it's or communism. That's really when history truly, really begins. Um, because each individual in that society can live up to or potentially live up to um, their full capacities as a human being. Yeah. They're not limited by their status as a worker in a capitalist system that is built on coercion and dominance. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And he writes about Marx a lot in this book. So the back okay. half of the book is, is, is a meditation or a sort of a exegesis on Marx and the notion of, what what makes capitalism work which is profits mm -hmm. which is profit and what what creates profit which is it's not just labor labor is kind of the shorthand for it but the real frame is socially necessary labor time which is you know that, that you're developing that you're you you are devoting socially necessary labor time as a worker to your profession or job and that socially necessary labor time the more you put into it you will never get the full value of your socially, you know, socially right. valuable labor time. And that's the form of profit. And what he wants is to live in a society which he calls democratic socialism. Now, I will say right out the bat that like, does this, when he describes democratic socialism, is he describing like the democratic socialism of say like Jacobin or the DSA? The answer is no. Like it's, okay. it's kind of a, a new conception of it. Um, uh, which is essentially <laughs> it's he's sort of reckoning with sort of the failures of socialism in the 20th century, as I think we all have, mm -hmm. um, whether it be and specifically reflecting on like the Soviet Union um, and how that was a society that had plenty of socialism, but didn't really have any democracy. Right. Or you can make the argument that it didn't really have much socialism at all, that it was sort of state capitalist or whatever. Yeah. Um, and he says a democratic socialist society is predicated upon moving us away from a society which is organized around profit to a society that's organized around what he calls socially available free time. So under capitalism, we are constrained by socially necessary labor time where we right. are in order to live, we have to provide our socially necessary labor time to others for a wage. Yeah. Um, and moving from a society where that's no longer the gauge of what of, of how we organize it to a society organized around human need and human flourishing and, and specifically the expansion of socially available free time. That that wealth in the future under socialism would be identified with not so much riches or profits, but would be recognized by the amount of free time we now have available. Mm. Um, and he reckon and and so it's you know it's that classic quote from marx in the, the the philosophical manuscripts of 1844 where he says you know like you know i will you know i will fish in the morning and i will critique in the evening and or i'll paint yeah. in the afternoon but i'm not a fisherman or a painter or a critique cr or a critic but i am all those things but i'm none of those things because i'm so much more than that under the system of socialism or communism yeah. we get beyond sort of the notion of like well i do this you know because you don't have to and so yeah. uh you know and so living in a society where the means of production are owned collectively and democratically so that's a component of it organizing our wealth in terms of free socially available free time rather than profit and and the expansion of political rights. So those are all things that kind of go hand in hand. So social, like de democratic socialism often sort of, sort of like devolves back into like social democracy or sort of welfare right. state capitalism, which is kind yeah. of what it is. 
But he's really actually going far beyond that. It's actually rather critical of social democracy because as okay. he rightly points out, social democracy is in, in some respects is contradictory because it's predicated on profits. Like in order for us to build the wealth necessary to have a, uh, the welfare state, you have to have exploitation in the form of the profit motive. Those right. profits can then be redistributed to others. And that necessarily may be a good thing, but it doesn't really solve the problem. Right. of capitalism. It sort of is a band-aid on the problem. So yeah. he's trying to go forward more than that. Um, oh, I don't mind that a little bit. Yeah. It's not quite where I go, but yeah, <laughs> that's not bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it, it's good that, uh, yeah, like he recognizes the, the limits of what is currently kind of labeled as democratic socialism. Yeah. For him, it's like a completely different conception. I mean, it's, so when we talk about like democratic socialism of like the DSA, think of it like capital D, capital S, like democratic mm -hmm. socialism. His is small d, small s, like in, in the sense that it's socialism that has a form of democ democracy in it. Right. Now, here's the issue I have with using the term democratic socialism. Mm -hmm. Socialism is inherently democratic. Right. That's kind call of the it, point. <laughs> when you call it democratic socialism, it's kind of redundant. Yeah. Because socialism is the expansion of democracy to the realm of production. That's what it is, in my estimation. Yeah. So uh, if you organize a society around collective ownership of the means of production and that the needs and, and wants of a society are determined democratically and socially rather than merely about the profit motive, then you, you have already achieved a level of democracy that wouldn't be achieved otherwise. So that's kind of the issue I have with calling it democratic socialism. You know. Uh, you know, you could call it other things. You could just call it socialism or you could just call it communism, which is what it really is. Like, yeah. um, but he doesn't want to, and this is really like the two big like criticisms I have of his like conception of socialism. So Martin Hagelin is a philosopher. He's not an economist, although mm. I think he understands Marx quite well and sort of clears up a lot of misconceptions about Marx, like specifically that like labor is the source of all wealth. Like, that's technically kind of true, but if you really want to get into it, it's not so much labor, it's socially necessary labor time. It's right. labor power that is really the source of wealth because that's what can then generate profits because labor without a sense of the of time, if you're just sort of working, then it sort of kind of falls apart. Um, it has to, It really does have to be recognized in the sense of labor power or labor time. Yeah. Because then it's measurable and then you can develop a sense of what profit might be in that system, um, which is Marx's criticism of the Gotha program, where he's sort of writing about in the Gotha program, you know, they say, well, labor is the source of all wealth. And Marx writes in his crit critique of the Gotha program, no, it's not. Socially necessary labor power is the source of wealth. It's the source of profits. Mm. It's because there's because you can labor for many, many things, but that doesn't necessarily in, in, in um, guarantee you a wage. So like, for right. example, like we all labor every day in the form of chores, but we don't get paid for any of that. Yeah, that's right. Does that labor really create wealth? Like, no, it doesn't, you know, but yeah. socially necessary labor power or labor time does because you're exchanging your labor power for a wage. Yeah. That's, you know, so there's that issue too. But in terms of like my criticisms of how I feel he conceptualizes socialism is it's rather abstract. Like it's, it's, he's oh. philosophically, it's very abstract, it's sort of broad, sort of reconceptualizing of how we would think about socialism. Is any of it particularly new? No. What mm. makes it new is his emphasis on socially available free time. And it's like a term he comes up with to describe okay. how we would measure wealth and socialism. The problem is the entire time I was reading this book, I kept thinking of this really kind of mediocre science fiction movie that came out maybe 15 years ago called in time okay where it's i think justin timberlake's in it and basically the entire society is organized around the measurement of time so instead of you having money you exchange part of your life for goods and you have like a meter on your arm that sort of tells you how much time you have left i and think so, i remember that movie so yeah. some people have more time than others and so like in the future, like how do we measure what socially available free time is? He never mm. really gets into that. Like how would you organize a society? How would you exchange goods in a society 
because we could do away with markets, but we're not necessarily going to do away with exchange. Like we, you know, like yeah, in a in a classless society or in a socialist or communist society, like I think you'd still have places where you'd go to you know get get your bread and you know get your toilet paper and stuff like that. The difference is, is it's like instead of exchanging like a wage, what would you do? Like that's really the question. And so I think, you know, what would you do? Would you have like time dollars? Like, like, would, would you? What, what's what would be the universal yeah. form of exchange? Because it's really difficult to exchange time. And the problem yeah. is, is if let's say like, oh, I will give you this good if you give me this amount of your labor time. Well, that's just reinforcing the same problem that capitalism has. Yeah. Because, you know, that just means you're exchanging goods. And in many respects, capitalism is actually more sophisticated because we have a universal form of exchange in the form of money. Right. Money and credit is, is an app. It's, it's, it, money and credit are an abstraction of, of labor time. That's what they are. And, uh, and so, you know, that's what debt is, right? Debt is money that you will pay in the future based on your labor power in the future. It's contingent upon you laboring in the future. So it's so like that's kind of the issue is like, how do you figure out the how you measure socially available free time? How does that work? Right. The other issue is that he doesn't really talk at all about how this happens. Um, he kind of hints at it, but he doesn't really get to the heart of it. Like, OK, so like, for example, he talks about how reforms are not enough. And he quotes Rosa Luxemburg. And we've we've talked about Rosa Luxemburg a lot in this episode yep. on this podcast we you know check out a rosa luxburg episode if you want to learn more but the gist of it is that if if you if the choice is reform or revolution you should choose revolution because reforms are not an end and in and of itself ends are not right. what we really want they're the means towards something else and a lot of democratic socialists of the dsa or jacobin type they kind of see the reforms as the ends in, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways mm -hmm. Um, there's a sort of limit limitation on what would be possible. Right. The problem is, is that revolutions in and of themselves are messy and there's no guarantee that what you get at the end of it is exactly what you want. That's right. Or better than what came before, you know, and that's not to say we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying like, these are real situations. Yeah. So he sort of, he sort of hints at like what the future would be like, but doesn't really give a sense of like, well, how would this actually be organized? How would you actually do this? And, you know, and unless you get to a society where it's like, you know, a, a society of abundance, like a Star Trek, where you have the replicators and you can just make things and, and we've dealt with the issues of climate and like, you know, like we've, we've figured out that nothing is zero sum, that like, you know, we're, everybody can win, yeah. um, you know, but it's unclear how we actually get there. Um, and I don't think you get there without political struggle. And in that sense, he does get that right. In okay. the last chapter of the book. He, he spends a lot of time writing about Martin Luther King and Martin Luther King's Poor People's Campaign in the late 60s, okay. fighting for the dignity of sanitation workers. Oh. Um, you know, toward, especially towards the end of his life, King was absolutely a socialist. Yeah. And, and uh, but was reticent to say that publicly. There's a section of the book where Haglin recounts how in a closed door meeting that was not recorded, um, or a part of it was recorded and then Martin Luther King like sort of signaled to an aide, shut the recording off and then, um, and then has it. So he starts, then he starts talking about socialism, mm -hmm. but then he says, if any one of you say that I said this to you, I will deny it. <laughs> and, and part of it was because he recognized the real danger of being sort of pegged to socialism at the time. This is the late 1960s, right? You know, and and of course, you know, what was he trying to do in Memphis when he was organizing sanitation workers? He was trying to build a a cross class, you know, a cross racial class based movement for the emancipation of the working class, particularly in the South and in the later in the sort of the later weeks of the Poor People's Campaign in 68 he even makes this very explicitly where he says we need to call for a general strike. Right. Which is very radical thing to say in 1968 For sure. in the context of the civil rights movement, which at that point was mostly reformist. Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence at all that as more radical that Martin Luther King became, the, the potential of his death became more pronounced.
Right. And of course, in April, on April 4th, 1968, he was gunned down. Right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it was found in a court of law that was more than likely the FBI that did it. Um, and so uh, for people who want to know more about that, I recommend kind of looking at, I think the book is like the, the man, like who really killed King. It's by William Pepper. who was okay. a lawyer who represented the King family in the civil suit. Um, and, uh, and so this, so we, we pretty much know, oh, at least in it. my opinion, that, that the government killed King. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty solid evidence. I think we've mm-hmm. got the demand better world has a uh, thought here. Uh, what should the left strategies be to combat the rise of fascists in the U S and Canada? I think ele- electoralists should support strategic cooperation between progressive parties. Unions usually help too. Um, I've been talking for a sec. So if you, if you want to sort of answer uh, that first, then I actually can give a comment. I actually have no idea, uh, what, uh, <laughs> the, a good strategy is for this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, uh, because I, I tend to believe like that the only way to defeat fascists is to like, def- like to, to beat them until they're gone. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so, yes. And sometimes uh, that involves things that are loud. That yeah, go that's right. And, and things that we're not actually supposed to talk about on YouTube. On YouTube. <laughs> exactly. I, under, I, I think there's also education campaigns can also yeah. help too. Uh, part of the trouble here is I think, in, especially in U S and Canada is that you have uh, political parties who will placate fascists uh, <clears throat> all over the place. They just love to be like friendly with the fascists because they still support capitalism and, and the state. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. 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 That's a good point. I mean, so what I would say is that um, I think that for me, we need to go back and kind of learn from the lessons of the sixties and the new mm-hmm. left. So as a story, and I can't help myself, I'm always going to the, past to figure out what we do now right so if you look at really the the failures of the left in this in, in the new left in the 60s and 70s really why did those movements fail and we talked about this in our last episode when we were talking about history of marxism in the united states but if you look at what happens is they create these broad movements that have very specific demands that are often very successful the civil rights movement's a good example of this right where the early parts of the civil rights movements were broad coalitions where it was churches, civic organizations, um, and unions who would work together to build this broader coalition to call for very specific demands, whether it was public accommodation, regardless of race or, you know, equal voting access and equal voting rights, um, equal housing, like those specific kind of tells. The problem is, is that by the time you get to 67, 68, Martin Luther King is already starting to think about this, this not being enough. And this is really the impetus behind the poor people's campaign. And what eventually would be described as what's called the freedom budget. The freedom budget was this idea that was developed by King and many other members of the civil rights movement, um, where it would be complete, a complete reconceptualization of the American state. Um, and it would be basically ending the war in Vietnam uh, at the time, um, ending our commitment to militarism and investing public money into the poor and into uh, marginalized communities, particularly black folks, um, particularly Native Americans and any other marginalized groups who were sort of a part of the the oppressed working class. With King's death in 1968, the hopes of the freedom budget kind of fall apart. Also in 1968, you see the the murder of Bobby Kennedy and the emergence of Richard Nixon in the New Right, which sort of plays into people's anxieties about, uh, quite frankly, racism, um, about the the progress that had been made in the 1960s. There was a significant blowback by people of the middle class, of the white middle class, who were not comfortable with the fact that they had to go, their kids had to now go to a school with black kids. They didn't like yeah, it. Yeah. And so, you know, Nixon really played into those hatreds. And um, those would, of course, come to sort of full froth with the Reagan administration. So to answer your question, this is my big preamble <laughs> to answer your question. I think the way that we succeed is similar to what you said, which is that 
I do genuinely believe that the, the future for the left in America is through unions. I think that's really yep. the only shot we got yep. at the moment. Um, and I think broad cross, you know, you know, cross racial class based organizing for really specific demands. Right. So we've seen the organizing around Palestine and how that has galvanized a lot on the left. I think that's a good thing. And what I would say is that look at what they're doing. Look at what they're specifically asking. You know, at the very minimum, a lot of them are asking for a ceasefire. To go even further, they're saying that, you know, U.S. should end its aid to Israel, yeah. so on and so forth. What I think is really important is for those who are on the activist left, who are consistently going to marches or demonstrations or doing on the, on the ground organizing, they need to hold local officials accountable for being representative of what the people actually want. We have seen over the last you know, few months, especially since uh, the, the attacks by Hamas, we've seen the sort of left in the United States or what it sort of passes as the left, like the squad or whoever, um, essentially default to Zionism rather than really have, you know, with the exception of like Rashida Tlaib, most of them have essentially, you know, they've either you know, voted present on specific resolutions in relation to Israel, they voted for it. Or you have some people like Pennsylvania Senator John Fetterman, who has basically said, oh, I've never was a progressive and just lied and is flip-flopped and is, and is now very consistently for Israel. Of course. So, so I do think that the, 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 the cause of Palestine is one that the left can get around. And I would say the other thing, too, is the emergence of union power. You know, we're seeing whether it's the, the, the Starbucks workers, Amazon workers, the Writers Guild and the Actress Guilds this past summer, yeah. early fall. We've seen a huge growth in worker power, and I think that's all a good thing. And that's what yeah. I would do is, you know, you know, have the rank and file start becoming more radicalized so that they can then build that kind of movement. Because I do think it's going to be a long term thing. I don't think this is something that's going to happen short in a short period of time. Um, I've often heard that the Bernie campaign in some respects was a shortcut to get to where we wanted to go, but that didn't work out. So now we have to do like the more long term work. Um, I know that was like a long answer to your question, but basically that's kind of my thinking. Yeah, that's a good, it's a good answer. <laughs> um, yeah. Do we have any other questions? No, we just have a oh. bunch of nonsense going on. Okay. <laughs> like weirdos being weirdos. Oh, okay. All right. Well, you know, maybe if you stop being weirdos, guys, you might learn something. That's um, right. <laughs> so, yeah. So what does it mean? So we, we kind of have tackled this, the notion of secular faith. and We've kind yeah. of tackled his idea of socialism and how that all works. Yeah. Um, what, do we, what does he mean by spiritual freedom? Well, what he means really by that is there's what he calls natural freedom. And then there's spiritual freedom. So natural freedom is um, our capacity to do things which sustain our lives, sort of the basics, right? So like the ability to, um, you know, to work, to eat, um, to procreate, to, you know, to have basic forms of recreation, so on and so forth. That's sort of natural freedom. Um, some animals on earth have more natural freedom than others. Um, this is a very compatibilist view of life where you have sort of free will, where everything is open for freedom in terms of your choices and decisions. And you have determinism, which is that everything is predetermined. You don't have a choice on anything. Compatibilism sort of acknowledges that, you know, higher, higher order animals might have or, you know, more complex animals have um, degrees of freedom that other animals don't. So, like, we have more natural freedom than, say, like a bonobo does even though they're fairly close to us. And the bonobo has more natural freedom than say like a dog. And then a dog has more natural freedom than say like an ant, like an ant or something like that. Um, so uh, natural. Yeah. Uh, uh, Demand better world uh, says we should set up anarcho communist choirs that just sing pop popular music to take advantage of the positive feelings that come with singing as a group. Oh, that's I like lovely. That. I that's like lovely. That. <laughs> I like that. That's I awesome. talked to somebody who wanted to do something very similar, which was sort of music as a way of changing the world. I think that's great. And I think that that is something very important too, which is to have a sense of hope mm -hmm. and positivity. I think there's a lot of 
anger, and rightfully so, I'm not saying it's not justified, but there's a lot of anger and I think a lot of pessimism. And while I think that a sense of re- being realistic is important and being angry is absolutely important, um, I think it's about channeling that anger and that frustration into things that are more positive. Because you're only really going to get people on, I think, in my opinion, I only think you're really going to get people on a positive message. Um, but I could be wrong about that. I mean, it, it, we've seen the rise of the, of the right in the world, and they've done it all through being sort of angry, vindictive jerks, and they've done quite well for themselves. So I could be quite wrong, but, yeah. you know. Um, well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> we were continuing. <laughs> yeah, so so that's natural freedom, right? So it's just yeah. the fact that we have a certain level of freedom as being a material being in the material universe. But then there's spiritual freedom, and that's basically we as human beings have the capacity to not only ask what to do, but to ask about asking what to do in the sense that we have double order oughts. So we like so we can think about what we ought to do, and then we can think about what we ought to do about what we ought to do. Um, And so that's what sort of gives us spiritual freedom is our capacity for acknowledging our own finitude and acknowledging our own capacities as living agents within a world and our capacity to connect within ourselves and sort of connect with who we are and connecting with others and how in our connection with others, we can understand ourselves. This is very Hegelian. And Hegel plays a very big part in this book um, because Hegel is one of Hagelin's favorite philosophers. And so, you know, uh, Hegel is often interpreted as being religious, but he really wasn't. You know, Mm. when he's talking about mind or geist or spirit, you know, the phenomenology of spirit, he's really talking about the capacity for humanity to um, kind of get beyond itself in the sense that we are connected to each other. So like there's a quote um, from Hegel's philosophy of right that I'll share here. And he says, there is nothing degrading about being alive. And we do, and we do not have the alternative of existing in a higher spirituality. And so what he's saying there is it's, he, he's not laying open the pot. Like people have interpreted Hegel as sort of leaving the door open for the possibility of a higher spirituality. Right. He really doesn't. He's very clear about like this, this notion of a higher spirituality doesn't really exist. But what does exist is our own sense of being alive and being connected to others and being connected to the world. For sure. And so for Hegel, the notion of God isn't really about like a guy that sits up in the sky with a big beard. Like God is basically like the ultimate understand, like the ultimate cause of our concern. It's very Paul Tillich. There was a theologian in the 20th century named Paul Tillich, and uh, he had he thought of of, of um, God or as being sort of what he called the ground of being. It's 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 sort of a, a very abstract notion of what it means to think about God. So okay. our collective responsibility is to ourselves and to each other towards moving towards like a better conception of what it would be like to live together. That could be seen as God in in the okay. sense that. So it's it's a very non corporeal god. It's not like a guy that lives up in the sky does things. It's, it's right, not right. And in some respects, it's not really God at all. Yeah. And so we can kind of we can sort of dash it and just say like, well, it's not God. It's it's our truly understanding of spirit, and that's like real spiritual freedom. So you know, there is no real freedom in religion. In religion, you have dictates that are told to you, and you have you have to, you either follow the dictates or you don't. There's no real wiggle room in between, right? Whereas spiritual freedom is predicated on acknowledging that, that this is the only life we have and moving us towards a place where we are recognizing that for ourselves and helping others recognize that. And in them recognizing it, we recognize our common cause together, a secular cause. And so when... Martin Luther King, for example, who was very influenced by Hegel, he would often talk about God in certain terms that were very traditionally religious, where it's like, you know, like, you know, the, the, if you trust in God and cleanse your sins, you'll be able to go to a different place and, you know, whatever. But he never really used that in his civil rights work. That was stuff that was mm-hmm. sort of, he would mm-hmm. sort of table that. 
and used the notions of religion and spirituality as a means of discussing social justice. Right. So when, when King is talking about God in the public square, he's talking about it in that Hegelian sense of like our shared responsibilities to ourselves and to others and a common cause. So that's really what we mean by spiritual freedom, that we get beyond religion. Because I think that's true. Uh, you know, I, we did an episode, oh God, almost two years ago now, I think, or a year ago or two years ago about yeah. um, Sartre's existentialism as a humanism. Yep. It was one of my favorite episodes we did. And in that episode, I, I um, you know, I basically make the same argument here that I'm, I did then. Sartre was very true truth about it, which is that we're almost post-religion in the sense that for all intents and purposes, God doesn't exist. We can kind right. of treat the world as if God doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, because whether he does or not, the world kind of acts like he doesn't. Yes, for sure. But we're kind of on our own, right? Yeah, that's right. And so if you want to believe in God, that's fine. But you can't really become truly spiritually free until you kind of abandon tradition, no, traditional notions of religion and open yourself up to the possibility of a new sort of spirituality of humanity. Um, and so that's like what that. I'm really about, because, I, you know, and so I think like if you have religious beliefs, that's fine. But recognize that like you can't really get to the heart of what needs to be done for humanity going through the traditional route, the, the route of traditional religion, you know, because it has to be a non, uh, either a secular viewpoint like Martin Hagelin's or it's sort of religious viewpoint with its emphasis on social justice in the form of King, where we recognize the secular causes first and the religious causes later. Um, if that makes any sense. I think so. I think, yeah, like there's no reason, like you say, like, there's no reason that people can't be spiritual. And uh, I think that spirituality in a sense can is, is how we connect to other people and can create a better world. Right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like you said, like it's clear that whatever's going on with religions right now, it's doing the opposite of that. Right. <laughs> yes. So people often think of religion as being a unifier, and and I don't think that's true at all. I think I religion think so. is is I, I think religion is a great divider. I think it I think it divvies people up. I think it puts people in teams, and my team is better than your team because my team my team's God is real, and your team's God is not, and so we you know we fight solely because of these sort of petty divisions that have really nothing to do with creating a better life. Yeah. Because that's the whole thing. Like religions are often a rejection of life. They're a rejection of what it means to be human because, you know, people are basically treating this world as if it's the doormat to get to wherever they want to get next, Right. you know, where they can scrape the shit off their shoes and then move on. Whereas yeah. like, this is truly precious. Like being a, being, being a human being who's existing in a universe is, is profoundly more spiritually enthralling to me than like believing in some God. I mean, it's, yeah. And and the other thing too is that like religions have some of this secular language already in it. Like Christianity for example does, mm -hmm. where God takes like the, the highest form of God is in human form. It's Jesus, right? Like right. like in order for him to fulfill everything that needs to be fulfilled within the dictates of the faith, God had to become a man. Yeah. He had to become a person. Yeah. He couldn't, he couldn't achieve everything he wanted to with humanity without becoming human himself. And that's pretty radical. Like, it's a radical read of Christianity, right? And up to the point, you know, and, and my, my view of this is informed by, by Martin Hagelin, obviously, but also like Slavoj Žižek and Terry Eagleton and others who've written about sort of secular readings of Christianity. So, like, when, when Jesus is on the cross, you know, and he's saying, like, God, why hast thou forsaken me? Like... But he knows, like, but he is God, so he knows the plan all along. Or does he? Because <laughs> that's really the question, right? Yeah. Why would God, as Jesus, be on a cross, dying, and look up to the sky and say, God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why would he do that? With, unless he had a sense of the finitive. Unless right. he had a sense of acknowledging that life is finite, that I'm going to die. Yeah. And you've brought this upon me, even though I did it to myself. This is the part that gets, this is the part where it gets weird. Yeah, um, that's the confusing stuff. <laughs> and it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And part yeah. of that's because, 
you know, there were different forms of Christianity and early Christianity where like Christ was a prophet, but he actually wasn't God. And then eventually it all becomes one thing. Well, um, yeah, like you say, like, cause, uh, Jewish people and Muslims don't believe that Jesus was God. No, they were just like, I, I'm not entirely sure what Jewish people believe, but I, I, as far as I know, Muslims just believe he was just another prophet in the same way, like Muhammad was a prophet. Exactly. So this is definitely how Islam sees it with Judaism. And I don't know everything about this, but at least in my, my sort of understanding. So in the old Testament, which is the, the book of Judaism, it, it talks about the Messiah coming back. So Jews generally think that like, that like a Messiah is coming, but it's not Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know who the Messiah is. It's not Jesus. Now there are some Jews who are like Jews for Jesus who do think that Jesus is the Messiah. And then you kind of like run into, and part of that is also the way that the new Testament is written. So like the new Testament is written where Jesus like intentionally fulfills prophecies that were in the old Testament. And people, and people often say, well, of course Christ is like the savior because he's fulfilling the prophecies of the old Testament. Right. And it's like, well, dumbass, like, don't you know that like they, they wrote the, the new book to match the old book. It's like, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's it's just a sense of of continuity, right? It's like if you give Superman, you know, late heat vision in book one, you have to make sure he still has heat vision in heat in book three. Like it's right. not it's not like you know. Now, if you had written the Old Testament after you wrote the New Testament, now that's a whole other story. But even then, just by logical reasoning, you're making the the, the newer material match the old material. You're right. retrofitting it to make the prophecies come true. Yeah. That's why prophecies are nonsense, because ultimately, either you get the prophecies wrong, which is very much the case. And you ignore um, that. <laughs> or you, and you ignore that. Or you write things to make it retroactively look like the prophecies became true when they yeah. kind of actually didn't. That's the part that's weird as well. It's like Jesus thought, like, you know, like his people thought his return was imminent. That, that's why people, the early Christians didn't have kids. They didn't yeah. have normal lives because they sort of thought he was coming back any day now. And it's like, no, it's been 2000 years. He's not coming back. Yeah, like, exactly. it's the, you know, and some people don't even think Jesus existed. I mean, I don't go that far, but there are some people who are mythicists. You don't even think Jesus exists. But the point of all of this is just really to make the really interesting point, which is that Christianity is one of the few religions where in order for the God to truly be, fulfill his potential, he had to become a human. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty radical. Like that, that in and of itself is fairly radical. So what's a radical secular read of that, which is that in order for us to truly fulfill our potential, we have to acknowledge our finitude as human beings. We have to acknowledge the fact that we live in frail bodies, which eventually weaken and die. And that knowing that we have finite lives, we will put everything of ourselves into everything that we do for ourselves and for others. Because that's the only thing that's ever going to give us salvation. Salvation doesn't come from without in the sense that it comes from a God. Salvation right. comes from within yeah. in the sense that we, we, work, we, we achieve our own salvation together in a secular cause. Uh -huh. And that cause is socialism. I mean, you know, to me, that's my cause. Like the secular cause that I believe in is, set, is socialism and humanism. Yeah. And to me, those two things go hand in hand. I don't think you achieve humanism without socialism. And mm. to me, people who are humanists, or sec especially secular humanists, and they're capitalists, that makes no sense to me at all. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, because it doesn't make it, it doesn't add up. No, it doesn't. But, it doesn't. Uh, I suppose we're almost at 55 minutes. We are getting close. So overall thoughts, I've only really been scratching the surface about this book. I think it's really excellent. Um, for those of you who might be intimidated by some of the, the, the ideas in the book, they're rather fairly simple. He has a very clear, uh, concise writing style where he often sort of re-elaborates on points to make sure that you, you get them clearly. Um, and the one thing I guess I'll kind of really leave it with is um, you know, kind of thinking about this idea that he has where religions will often think about creating what is called the new Jerusalem, you know, the, the idea of heaven. Mm. And he has this idea of not the new Jerusalem, but he calls it the new Memphis. 
Okay. And so the, the new Memphis um, is really the cause of socialism, that the cause of creating that democratic humanist socialist society that we all would like to live in. So I'm going to read a passage real quick. To speak of the new Memphis rather than the new Jerusalem is to avow that we can achieve our collective emancipation in this life. The new Memphis is the object of a secular faith, a spiritual cause that moves us to take action and fight to establish the social conditions for mutual recognition of our freedom. And so, you know, I've talked about this a lot on the podcast. We on the left need to take back the concept of freedom. The right has had it for far too long, and they are the only people, it seems, in our political discourse and mainstream political discourse who get to talk about freedom. Mm. You do not have freedom. You do not have freedom of without freedom from. You have to have positive liberties, reinforce negative liberties. You can't have freedom of speech. You can't have freedom of worship. You can't have freedom of association without freedom from want and freedom from fear, as FDR framed it. Freedom from want in the sense that we create a society where people's needs are met, where they are no longer under the thumb of exploitation, where they're no longer under the thumb of oppression in capitalism. Yeah. And that we we abolish capitalism and we smash the capitalist state in order to create the new Memphis, which is socialism. That's that's essentially it. So, uh, you know, abandon the sense of like, well, we'll have something better in the next life. Fuck that. (laughs) We have this life now. Yeah. Build the the better world now. Build it now. Build it now. And, you know, because a better world is possible. We know that it is. And um, the other thing, too, is that, yes, will we will we be working towards something that maybe we will never see? Yeah. Yeah. But that's all the more reason to do it, because the people who come after us will benefit from what we've done. And in in that, that's the only real immortality we're ever going to get. As if we can help establish the conditions for the betterment of their lives, yeah, that's better than anything that could ever be given to us in the form of heaven. Yeah, for so sure. so that's the idea of the new Memphis, and that is um, this life: secular faith and faith and spiritual freedom by Martin Hagelin. I, it's a lovely book. I highly recommend people read it. Right um, I think that it is. Um, I think it's probably one of the most beautiful and and eloquent expositions of the intersection between sort of secular humanism and socialism that I've ever read. And we're going to do another book later on this year called um, Humanism and Socialism by George Novak that kind of hits on some of these I themes. See. But yeah. but this book is really, I think, um, exactly the kind of thing that we on the left need, because I think that we on the left who are secular need to articulate our secularism better. It's not yeah. enough just to say that we're anti-religion right. or, or even really that we are anti-religion, but that we need to articulate what we do believe and what we do want to fight for and what our causes really might be. Yeah, I, so do, this is a, yeah, yeah. I definitely lean that way too, where we have to have a positive message rather than just the anti, anti-religion or the anti-message. We have to have a, yeah. a positive thing to send. So. And we have to have a conception of what socialism will really look like, what we could actually achieve, right? Because it's, mm-hmm. it's anti-capitalism is great to a point, but we have to right. also acknowledge like, well, what can we offer to people that's better? Yeah. And that, that's the idea of the new, the new Memphis. That's the idea of socialism. Right on. So I guess, what are we covering next time? So next time we are doing, um, I believe I lost my my thing here but anyway i believe next time we are doing the wartime pamphlets of gore vidal oh interesting Um, yes so yes we are okay so uh next next time we'll be covering three short books by novelist author intellectual gore vidal who's my favorite author um and uh he wrote three books in the early 2000s during the the bush administration Um, called Perpetual War for Perpetual Peace, Dreaming War, and Imperial America. And uh, they are collections of his essays. um, And we will talk about what it meant to be somebody in his late 70s, early 80s, writing about the violence of the Bush administration 
very eloquently as somebody who was a veteran of World War II and yeah. someone who has been who was a trenchant critic of the American Empire. So, so next time we'll be talking all things Gore Vidal. Nice. All right. So I guess all that's left is where can people find you? People can find me at justinclark.org. That's my website right down there. You can also find me on social media. I'm Justin Clark PH. PH stands for public history. I'm on Instagram, Threads, and Blue Sky. So give me a follow there. Um, I'm more active on Instagram than I am at anything else, but I'm trying to get more active on Threads. Um, mm-hmm. And as I always say at the end of every episode, please consider becoming a patron um, of the Skeptical Leftist. Um, we uh, have been doing a lot of terrific work, especially Corey. Um, has been doing a tremendous amount of work and really interesting issue uh, interviews lately um, with some really interesting guests. And uh, we want to make sure that we can continue doing the work here that yep, we're doing. Sure. And, uh, and so, yeah, definitely consider becoming a patron. It would be much appreciated for sure. All right. Well, thanks everybody who uh, wasn't being a weirdo in the chat and uh, <laughs> have a good night. Yes. Thanks everybody who, who, uh, who watched and thank you for your great questions. All right. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Uh, Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it. And it helps me keep the internet and power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Some Random Geek, Damian Marie at Hope, Justin Clark, Christopher Taylor, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to my new patrons, You can stay tuned for the list of patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a patron and want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. These days, I also have a Substack and a ghost where you can subscribe for free or you can donate a per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes. If you can't contribute financially, then a like on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities, as well as the other shows that I do. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. Also, make sure to stick around for a clip from this episode's post-show chat between me and Justin. But it's a true story about a car company that was created by a guy named Preston Tucker who wanted to try to create the car of the future, but not just the car of the future, but the car that had safety features. So it had mm. seat belts. It put the engine in the back because it's safer in accidents to have the engine in the back than it is to have it in right. the front. Um, it came with windshield wipers. It had all these kinds of innovative ideas that have become, in many respects, commonplace in cars today. Right. Um,